Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome everybody to the Reedsville Chamber of Commerce. We are very excited to be kicking off um, our topics at 12 series again for the first time in person since 2019, I believe. So I'm Diane Sawyer. I'm the president here. Um, this has been a very successful series for us and uh, we're living in different times now. So we're a little virtual on Zoom and live streaming on Facebook and in person too. So we've got it all going on. Um, very excited about this particular series. It's a five part series starting today with installment loans. And um, we are going to be in partnership with many organizations, but particularly I'd like to recognize NC100 for bringing this idea to us. And um, thank you to Merrill and his group. And we are going to turn it over and get started right away. So I'm going to turn it over to Demarcus Andrews, who's going to introduce our speaker. Um, and he is with the Center for Responsible Lending. All right. Well, welcome, everyone. Um, I appreciate everyone joining us, whether it's in person or virtually. Uh, my name is Demarcus Andrews. I am the Director of Engagement and Outreach, as well as the North Carolina Policy Manager at the Center for Responsible Lending, um, aka CRL. Um, and for the folks that are in the room and online that do not um, know about our work, uh, we work on credit and debt issues that impact um, vulnerable and communities of color. And our focus in this area is creating a financial marketplace that is fair, fair and inclusive um, for everyone, regardless of where you fall on the financial spectrum. And kind of our acute focus in this work is literally to build and protect wealth um, for marginalized communities. Part of my responsibility at CRL um, is heading up a statewide coalition, um, which is an extension of CRL. And, and we use a variety of advocacy tools to achieve high impact reform um, that impacts um, vulnerable community and protects wealth. And through our work with the coalition is actually where I partner with NC100 and Merrill Holloway um, for this three part event series. Um, and what we wanted to do is basically sit down with community um, and here in Rockingham County and see what impact um, financial issues are are, you know, are happening um, here and impacting um, residents uh, within this county. And so um, that has brought us here today um, to talk about installment loans um, and their impacts on consumers. Um, and so uh, I will introduce um, our speaker for today, Rochelle Sparko. Um, she serves as the director of North Carolina policy for the Center for Responsible Lending. <coughs> She focuses on state level policy here in North Carolina. She works with legislators, regulators, and enforcement agencies to promote access to affordable credit and debt collection policies and practices that enable credit worthy borrower a path to repayment uh, with fair terms. She developed expertise in the civil collection of criminal justice debt, the use of confessions of judgment in consumer installment loans, and state and federal efforts to clearly legalize and regulate early wage access products. Prior to her time at CRL, Rochelle advocated in the Carolinas and at the federal level for sustainable agriculture policy, represented homeowners in the state and federal suits against lenders and servicers during the foreclosure crisis, and represented low-income individuals as a young attorney at the Legal Aid Society of Hawaii in Honolulu. She is a graduate of Bernard College, um, the Jewish Theological Seminary, and Georgetown University Law Center. In her spare time, she tries to bake a decent biscuit and delicious challah. <laughs> and apparently success is pending. Um, My biscuits are not. So I will now open the floor for Rochelle and her presentation. Thanks, Demarcus. You're welcome. Yeah, to my sorrow, the biscuits taste really good, but they're flat. <laughs> Still working on that. All right. Uh, let me go backwards here. All right. Thank you all for coming um, to the uh, presentation of the scintillating topic of consumer finance loans or installment loans. I'll do my very best to make it exciting and interesting. Um, I will ask some questions, but um, I've got some gunners over here in the corner who can provide answers if people are shy, so <laughs> don't feel like you have to talk if you're here. Um, so just to give you all a sense of where we're going today um, over the course of the next hour or so, 
Here's an agenda. Um, I was going to give a little bit of background about the Center for Responsible Lending, but I think DeMarcus covered that really well. Um, if you all have questions about the organization, I think either of us would be glad to hear those and do our best to answer them. Um, but I'll probably skip over that slide. Um, we'll then talk a little bit about installment lending in North Carolina today. What is it? What is installment lending for consumers? How does it shape up as against installment lending for businesses? How do we regulate it here in North Carolina? Um, and what do we know? Like, what are the rules of the road? Um, once we kind of have a sense of what installment lending is and how it works, we'll talk a little bit about the future of installment lending here and sort of somewhat broadly. Um, there are things happening in other states and a few things that are happening here that could impact the second section of our agenda, right? It could make some changes to how installment lending functions in the state. And then I'll leave some time for Q&A because I know all of you are going to be filled with questions by the end of this about this exciting loan product. <laughs> um, I'll leave the slide up for a second, though I won't really address it. I do just want to take a moment to thank Merrill Holloway from NC100 and Diane Sawyer from the Rockingham Chamber of Commerce and Demarcus Andrews from CRL for putting on this event today and for inviting me to speak here. Um, You've heard my introduction so from DeMarcus, so I don't think I need to dwell on that any further. If any of you have um, tips about how to make the biscuits rise a bit better, I'll take them at the end. <laughs> they taste like cook. I mean, they're just like butter cookies. They're very good, but, <laughs> but they're not biscuits. Um, so with that, I will. Does anybody have questions about CRL before I just sort of breeze by that? OK, great. All right, so now let's get into the meat of our discussion today. What is installment lending? So first up, what do you guys think of when I say installment loan? Boredom or I have no idea is a fine answer. <laughs> I know for me, I think about paying something back over time. Okay, I see some nods around the room paying something back over time. Great, anything else come up? Yeah, just periodic payments. Periodic payments. Okay, great. Um, so that kind of starts to get at maybe what makes an installment loan different from other kinds of loans, right? So is there, a, a, based on my bullet point here, you could potentially understand that there are other ways to pay back a loan. Um, thoughts about what other ways to pay back a loan might be? What is there besides installment? Is there any other way to pay some? Aren't you love some? Okay, great. So we call those balloon payments, right? Another option is you take out, borrow some money, and you pay back the whole thing all at once at some later date, right? It, we call it a balloon because the, the whole big thing gets paid back at once. Anything else? All right. I think, you know, we see other types of um, combinations of those two, right? If anybody has ever known someone that took out, for instance, like a, um, like a construction loan, um, sometimes you would make what are called interest-only payments, meaning you're only paying back the interest that accumulated that month. Um, and then at the end of the loan term, you make a balloon payment, right? That whole big thing all at once. Um, and as DeMarcus mentioned in my intro, I used to do foreclosure-related work before the foreclosure crisis, we oftentimes saw still other repayment plans that we called negatively amortizing payments, which meant that you would pay even less than the interest that had accumulated on the loan each month. And so the amount of principal that you owed increased rather than decreased over time as you made payments. So those are some other kinds of options um, of ways to repay a loan. Um, how do you get an installment loan? Through a lender? Through a lender. Great. Yes, that is absolutely an option, is to get one through a lender. Um, types of lenders, where could you go to find a lender? Bank, bank, credit union, finance Great. company. Yes. Okay. So we're hitting a lot of the best top 10 hits here. Top three hits, bank, credit union. Um, Great, great examples, and many banks and credit unions offer sort of smaller, we're going to talk a lot about smaller installment loans um, during this presentation today, and a lot of banks and credit unions do offer that. 
Um, okay, so basically what we're gonna talk about today are the particular, as I said, this particular type of installment loan, what we at CRL would call a small dollar loan. Um, generally speaking, these are loans, at least in North Carolina, that are gonna be $15,000 or less. In other states, they might be slightly larger than that. Um, small dollar loans is sort of a big bucket that we at CRL use to talk about these types of installment loans. We also use that bucket to talk about payday lending, which we don't allow in North Carolina, but it exists in a lot of other states. Um, right, Payday lending are balloon payment loans. Right, We talked about what a balloon payment is a minute ago. These are very small dollar loans, usually less than $1,000. You borrow it for the period of your paycheck, basically, and the whole amount that you borrowed plus a fee is due at the end. Um, we also talk about overdraft as being a small dollar loan, right? So when you basically borrow against your checking account, some banks or credit unions would charge you an overdraft fee if you take out more money than you have in your checking or savings account. Um, and so the cost to borrow that money from the bank is a, is a short term, shorter term, um, a shorter term small dollar loan. Um, and there are also a couple of sort of innovative products that are out there now that most people I think at this point have heard about, one of them being buy now, pay later products, right? Whenever you buy something, usually on the internet, but I think you can get it even in stores now too, um, that you would buy the product now and you would make four installment payments over time um, and that is also a small dollar loan. Um, another example of this is early wage or earned wage access, a product that we see being used a lot in like big box stores and fast food companies um, where you can gain access to your wages before payday in exchange for paying a fee. So kind of similar in some ways to a payday loan. Um, some types of small dollar loans have rules that they need to follow and some of them don't yet have rules that they need to follow, right? I was talking about these innovative products, earned wage access, buy now, pay later. These are kind of newer. They rely a bit on um, sort of newish, I don't, it's not even new anymore, but newish technology like an app on your phone. Um, and so far in most states and at the federal level, laws and regulations haven't caught up with these innovative products yet. And so they're largely operating without rules. Um, other products have been around a lot longer, like overdraft, like payday lending, like installment loans, sort of typical installment loans. And those do have rules and regulations that they need to follow um, in order to make those products available to consumers. Um, so whether a particular company needs to follow state rules federal rules, both state and federal rules, or no rules at all, depends on what the product is. Um, and so we'll dive in a little bit more deeply into particularly the rules that govern installment loans for today. Um, before we move on, do folks have questions or comments? Everybody looks okay. Okay. Like I said, you don't have to. <laughs> so with companies yes. like Dave, like I know on social media, I see a lot of like, you can get like $75 like now. Um, so would Dave be considered uh, one of these installment lenders? I think, isn't Dave an early wage access company? Maybe, I haven't actually looked into it because I'm always apprehensive about any like money right now. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> like, hmm, that seems a little bit scammy. It may not be a scam, but I think Dave is a is an earned wage access provider. I believe so, because I think my son checked into something like that one yeah. time. Cash flow. Yep. 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 And, and so, and I think, I mean, it worked well. There's a fee. I mean, yep. everything was legit for whoever needs to know that. But, um, but yeah, I think that's kind of more like an advance. Yep. I think they would ask for some information about your employer, your paycheck, your hours. Um, and then there's m many of those earned wage access companies um, offer a, a version of their product for free. Not all of them. Um, but you usually have to wait several days in order to get the cash deposited into your account. And the fee comes if you need the cash immediately. And for most people who are trying to get an advance on wages that are likely coming in like six or seven days anyway, that fee to get the money immediately is usually where they're making their money. 
So I was going to ask, so often is it predatory? Um, it can be, right? And so here's where things, this is why oftentimes state or federal governments will get involved in regulating a product, um, is to make sure that it's not, or at least not inherently predatory. Um, and so in some states, many states will see payday lending regulated to the point where there are no payday lenders in the state, right? Payday lending is actually not illegal in North Carolina. It just has to comply with North Carolina's usury limit, right? The amount of money that you can charge for lending somebody money. And payday lenders don't want to charge that little, and so they don't operate here. Um, and so we do a similar thing with installment lending, right? We regulate it to make sure as best we can that it's not predatory or that it's less likely to be predatory. And that's sort of the, if any of you drive stick, this is kind of how I think about it is, right? Like you've got the gas and you've got your clutch and you're trying to find that sweet spot of making credit available to people who aren't likely to qualify for a prime loan, right? They're not going to be able to walk into their bank or their credit union and get an, a, a very affordable loan product, but we still want people to be able to access credit but we want to make sure that that access is not so expensive as to trap people in debt basically forever or to strip wealth out of their family in exchange for trying to get a loan to you know, meet an expense, whether that's fixing their car, getting a new washing machine because there's broke, whatever it is. Right? Like I live in a really old house that was built in 1895, and right now an entire wall of my bedroom is missing. <laughs> like, I wasn't expecting that. Um, and I am fortunate enough to be able to walk into a bank and be able to get a loan to fix the rotten studs in my wall. <laughs> um, but that's not true for everybody. Um, but that doesn't mean you should have to live in a house that could collapse at any moment or be mildewy. Like we're trying to find that sweet spot between predatory and recognizing that some borrowers are more risky than others. Um, and so that's kind of where installment lending falls, at least for North Carolina. Rashad, I had a quick question yeah. about, so there's like, so during this time of year, in the next couple of months, there will be folks who will um, end up going to tax prepare servicer X. Yep. And there's a loan process, I guess, to get the rapid refund. Yep. And then what happens then is you're going into the market and uh, maybe purchasing furniture that is, you take it home, and then no payments for 36 months, you know, so is that included in like this conversation or is that a separate type of deal? Like those are two different types of loans. So, yeah, you know, I'm like, there's two things happening there. Yeah, so these rapid refund or tax preparation loans are in North Carolina are governed by a different set of regulations than installment lending is. Um, but also there we do worry about predatory lending in that context. The cost for those rapid refunds loans can often be quite high which is kind of weird because they're zero risk loans, um, right? H&R Block or whatever company prepares your taxes knows exactly how much you're going to get back. And they set it up, I from what I understand, that the money actually comes directly to the tax preparer and that they take their money out of it before giving you whatever's left over, if any. And so they know the money's coming, so the amount of the fee should be very low because it's just time. There's no risk um, or very, very low risk that they've prepared the, your taxes incorrectly. Um, so we do worry about those being predatory potentially um, and regulate them for that reason. Um, as far as the sort of buy now, pay later, but much longer term model, um, I think it depends on the company. I don't think there's necessarily anything inherently predatory on put, based on putting payments off if the lender is willing to take that risk. Again, it's just looking at the terms and making sure that you understand as the consumer what's happening. A lot of times with those like no payments for 36 months or however many months it is, oftentimes there's interest accumulating during all of those months. Um, and so by the time you get to the end of the uh, sort of teaser period, you owe a lot more money potentially than you did when you purchased the furniture. So looking out for something like that and making sure that you as the consumer can afford what the payments will actually be once they start um, and, and want to afford the payments at that time is, I think, a key piece of figuring out 
um, whether a loan like that would meet your needs as a consumer or would potentially put you in a place where your living room set is making it so that you can't afford rent or mortgage anymore. Um, once you enter repayment, it might be an installment loan. Um, the furniture purchase, it just sort of depends on how, how you're buying it. Um, right? Credit cards are a type of sort of open-ended installment lending. What we're going to talk about today is closed-ended credit, right? You borrow a certain known amount and have a bunch of payments that are of a known amount over time. Um, as opposed to revolving credit, sometimes those purchases are, I think, more credit card-like or may even be through a credit card. But they can also be installment loans through a consumer finance lender um, where you would know how, you, how much your payments are going to be and over what period of time. Does that answer it? Absolutely. Okay. Other questions? All right, before we move on to the next slide, I want to try and draw an and we started drawing it already, but making sure we have a sense of the distinction between just sort of the big installment loan world and a consumer finance loan, right? So a consumer finance loan is a subset of installment lending, right? So an installment loan could be anything from like your mortgage payment, right? That's generally nowadays done on installment, right? You know you have 30 years or however many years of payments at a certain amount and you pay an installment each month um, and at the end the loan is paid off. Um, and we've talked about a bunch of other types of loans like buy now pay later, which are also an installment loan but of a much shorter period. Um, so sort of thinking through what might be the differences between the big big broad brush of installment loan and what's a consumer finance loan, right? <coughs> My questions on here are basically, is a consumer finance loan different from an installment loan? And if it is, how? And I think we've kind of talked about that, right? It is an installment loan. A consumer finance loan is a particular type of installment loan. Um, and I think we've also started covering, like, where do you go to get a consumer finance loan? We kind of got into that already with Debbie much earlier in this slide, um, where we talked about you know, you can go to a consumer finance lender. Um, does anybody know what are some examples of consumer finance lenders? Or am I the only person that knows the names of the companies? Which is also fine. I'm just sort of curious. What, Len, one Main, maybe? One Main, yep. Lendmark. And Lendmark is another one. Yep, those are some of the big multi-state companies. Um, there are also a number of North Carolina-based companies, like Time Finance is one of the big ones. Um, but there are a bunch of other ones. But yeah, you guys have got the basic idea. I think there are some, some companies that operate across the state of North Carolina and some companies that are specific to a particular county or region that offer these types of loans that we'll talk about. Okay, before we get really deeply into consumer finance loans, I did want to take a minute, especially because we're here at the Chamber, um, to talk about the, some differences between installment lending for businesses and installment lending for consumer purposes. Um, I'm not gonna dwell on this a lot unless we have tons of questions about it, in which case I'm willing to spend some time here. Um, but I did wanna point out that there is installment lending available for businesses. Um, I do not believe that the same companies that make consumer finance loans also offer these types of business installment loans, but I could be mistaken about that. Um, I know far less about the business side of things since it's CRL. Uh, we focus on consumer lending issues. Um, but because of the sort of relationship that we'll talk about now between installment lending for business and <laughs> consumer loans, it seemed worth bringing up at least. Um, the first thing I would want you guys to know is that installment lending to businesses is way less protected than installment lending to consumers. So we worry as a state and also at the federal level a lot more about predatory lending to individual consumers than we do to businesses which kind of makes sense, right? We expect, I think, businesses to be sort of more savvy, know more about commerce um, than individual people out in the marketplace who need $10,000 or $4,000. Um, that being said, if you work at the chamber, my guess is you know that that's not always true, right? And that particularly small businesses don't have a great deal of savvy necessarily about lending and the cost of lending and they're much less protected when they borrow for their business than they are when they borrow for themselves for personal purposes or household purposes. Um, one of the things that we will talk about 
as we dive deeper into what protects consumers who are taking out installment loans is disclosure, right? So consumers are entitled to see a piece of paper that tells them the cost of credit. Businesses don't get that. And so it does mean that it's hard for business borrowers to compare the cost of credit from one company offering them a loan to another company offering them a loan because the disclosures won't look the same. They may not get disclosures really at all. There's no requirement here, sort of wild west. Um, and so you as a business borrower are just sort of out there trying to figure out for yourself whether one loan product is better for you than another without being able to sort of compare apples to apples. Um, and that can make it hard for people to make good decisions. What I've also heard, though, is that it's difficult for small businesses to secure loans anyway, right, to go and get access to credit. And so, you know, we've sort of heard from some folks that there's a question about whether disclosures would be very helpful um, because there just aren't a lot of options. So there's not a lot of comparison shopping happening, um, especially in the small business context. Um, but I did want to make sure that y'all knew that, that small businesses are not entitled to these same protections or large businesses that consumers will get that we'll talk about. Um, another thing that got a lot of media attention a little less than a year ago um, is the fact that there are very few protections in the debt collection context for business borrowers, but there are a lot of protections in the debt collection context for consumer borrowers. And one of the things that business borrowers do not get is protection from confessions of judgment. So in North Carolina and throughout the Southeast, consumer borrowers cannot be asked to sign what's called a confession of judgment when they take out their consumer loan. A confession of judgment is a piece of paper that basically gives the lender the right to file a judgment against the borrower at any time with the courthouse. And for those of you who have ever worked in or around or known someone who's had a judgment against them, once that judgment is filed at the courthouse, it means that the sheriff can come and levy your property for at least 10 years to pay off that debt. And so that cannot happen to a consumer borrower in North Carolina or elsewhere in the Southeast. On the other hand, business borrowers are not protected from this. And so it is the practice, from what I understand, of many lenders to small businesses to, as part of all of the paperwork that goes along with a loan closing, to have a borrower, a business borrower, sign a confession of judgment that basically says, yep, I owe you this money, you can file this as a judgment against me, and you can collect on it at any time. Some lenders would then promptly take that confession of judgment to the courthouse and file it, like before missed payments, before default, like before the first payment was even due, file that judgment. And what that would mean is that at any point, the lender could decide to levy the property of the business in order to pay off that loan, even if the borrower was making timely payments. Um, needless to say, once this started happening with somewhat startling regularity, particularly in the state of New York, uh, both state and federal governments started to notice because small businesses were freaking out justifiably um, because their bank accounts were getting seized. <laughs> and they were making payments on their loan. Um, or perhaps they hadn't made payments on their loan and had missed one and all of a sudden their assets were frozen and they could no longer continue doing business because they had no access to money. Um, so this has been getting, the business context piece has been getting some attention, um, but there are still really serious discrepancies in the protection that consumers get versus the protection of business borrowers or commercial borrowers. So just wanted to make sure you guys knew about that and also wanted to let you guys know that at least a couple of years ago, the Rural Center, um, an advocacy organization here in North Carolina, was pushing a bill to um, require disclosures for small business lending, right? So that in an effort to make it so that small business borrowers could actually compare apples to apples, the cost of credit, the way that consumer borrowers get to. Um, that bill did not move two years ago, but from what I understand, they're planning on having it introduced again this year, and so there may be a, another effort um, to try to get that passed. And so particularly for small business members and for folks involved with the chamber, I wanted to make sure to flag that for you all. Um, questions? <coughs> Horrified looks about people from New York who were getting their assets frozen by their evil lenders. 
<laughs> feel free. I there are some really excellent articles out there about this practice that just were like mind-bogglingly bad. Um, so what if that's <laughs> not filed, right? They can sit on it, um, and that is probably the better practice. Mm -hmm. um, if you are going to allow a confession of judgment to be signed at the time of the loan closing, which I think is certainly in the consumer context is a terrible idea. I don't know as much about the business lending context and whether it makes more sense there. Um, but I do think the better practice would be to hold on to it unless and until there were a problem. Um, because the idea that you're seizing somebody's bank account while they're still in repayment uh, or making like meaningful efforts to repay just is to me like, be illegal. Yeah. yeah, like that just seems not right. Um, I think also, you know, there is the potential to ask a borrower who's missing payments to sign one as a way of like entering into a new modified repayment plan or something like that. But to sign it at the at the loan closing and then to immediately file it just seems very duplicitous. Um, and uh, it just feels very unlikely that a borrower, especially a small business owner, is really going to understand what they're signing. And I can absolutely imagine what that loan closing looks like and the lender who's doing the closing saying like, this is a piece of paper that says that if you don't pay, that I can come after your assets, which sounds normal, right? If you've ever bought a house, like, okay, if I miss my mortgage payment or my car payment, like you're gonna come back after the piece of property. Um, and, and so I can just very easily imagine it being sort of semi-accurately described, but not really giving the borrower the full picture of what they're agreeing to. Um, leading to these horror stories that we saw in the media about a year ago where people were just like, I had no idea what was going on. And all of a sudden I couldn't like buy stuff for my business anymore. I can imagine, especially for somebody like that's not, not savvy, savvy as like a sole proprietor, you know, and yep. like you've merged in like your personal, your personal into yeah. your yep. LLC or it's, whatever. Right. It just, yeah. mm puts you at a lot of risk, especially for small business, that smaller businesses and those sole proprietorships in particular, and also, you know, very small businesses, you know, the kind of businesses that we saw having trouble accessing PPP loans a couple of years ago are the same businesses that are likely to get caught up in something like this where their lender can truly take advantage of them. Um, but it runs the gamut to larger businesses too. I mean, depending on how big your business is and whether you can afford to have a lawyer on staff or on retainer to review your documents, you may just be out there doing the best you can because hiring a lawyer is expensive um, and seems often not worth it to people or businesses that are operating on slim margins. So it makes it easy for folks to take advantage. Um, but again, there are sort of some efforts afoot to rein that in a little bit. And again, I'm not sure I don't know a ton about it. I've given you basically everything I know, but I do think there are sort of predatory feeling practices um, and policymakers are taking an interest, including here in North Carolina. Okay, so let's spend some time talking about what we know about installment lending, particularly consumer installment lending in North Carolina. So here we're gonna talk about consumer finance loans in particular. We've already mentioned that they probably have to follow some state and some federal laws. So let's talk about what some of those are. Um, we've already touched on one or two in conversation up to now. So one of them is this confession of judgment piece right, where we said that business borrowers or commercial borrowers may be signing confessions of judgment at the loan closing, um, but that should not ever be true at a consumer finance loan closing. No one should ever be asking a borrower to sign an agreement to have a judgment filed against them at the loan closing. Um, beyond that, they should also not be signing a confession of judgment or be asked to sign a confession of judgment at any point during their repayment. Um, or at least they weren't supposed to until August, I think, of last year. North Carolina recently changed its law and made it so that it would be permissible for a lender to ask a borrower to sign a confession of judgment after they had missed a payment or were late on one payment. 
Um, this is an outlier in the Southeast where no state allows, no other state allows a borrower or a lender to ask for a confession of judgment or take one from a borrower unless and until there's been a lawsuit filed and that lawsuit has been served on the borrower, um, right? So the litigation wheels are turning and then basically to settle that litigation, if they want to settle it rather than go through to a judgment, the borrower could be asked at that point to sign a confession of judgment legally. That's allowed in some southeastern states. Most southeastern states bar taking a confession of judgment from a borrower in a consumer finance loan at any time. So North Carolina is out here standing alone saying that once you are late on a payment, your lender can approach you and ask you to sign a confession of judgment in order to put you into back into repayment, basically. There's no need to file a lawsuit. Um, I will say that we are working to try and change back because this isn't really a place we want to be in North Carolina is less protective of consumers than everywhere else around us. Um, and also because it's a very difficult thing for our banking regulator to enforce, right? So our banking regulator, the commissioner of banks oversees consumer finance lenders, right? They're responsible for making sure consumer finance lenders are following the law and doing the right thing. And right now, they're in this place of confusion because North Carolina state law says you can ask for a confession of judgment from a borrower at any point once they are late on a payment. Federal law, on the other hand, says that you cannot take a confession of judgment from a borrower unless a lawsuit has been filed and served on the borrower, right? So that minority position in the Southeast is also the federal rule. And so now our banking regulator is in a position of not knowing what to tell consumer finance companies about how to behave. And it's confusing, and that can be very bad. If you're a business, you don't know how to engage with your borrowers legally. Um, the banking regulator doesn't know how to advise the entities that they oversee, and consumers are kind of caught in the middle here um, and are less protected right now, but also there's just confusion. Um, so hopefully, fingers crossed, um, we are going to be working with the folks that made that change to the law last year. We've sort of impressed upon them why it was maybe not the best plan they ever had. Um, and I think they are going to work with us um, to get that provision repealed. But just so that y'all know, for now, there's sort of maybe not a hot mess, but a, a warm mess in that area. Um, so borrowers for now, hopefully temporarily, are a little bit less protected and consumer finance companies are a little bit more confused about what they can and can't do legally. So if a consumer is in that space mm -hmm. um, where there's the conflict between state and federal law, can they then avail themselves of federal protection? I think they could and that's part of why I think the banking regulator wants this settled. Um, because the entities they regulate are at risk, right? Because I do think that the North Carolina law being less protective than the federal law right now means that there is some room to file a complaint with the Federal Trade Commission and the penalties for violating the FTC's rule are kind of stiff. Um, and so I think it's a $10,000 penalty and the average loan size is about $2,000. Um, and so it's possible for a borrower to take on a larger loan than $2,000, but the bulk of loans made in North Carolina by consumer finance lenders are two to $3,000. Um, so it's risky. Um, and it's just not, it's, it's a bad place to be in. And so I do think I have a lot of hope that we'll be able to clean it up. Um, just because th this is, we're not in a place I think where anybody feels really good right now. Um, because of the questions about liability and and so it just isn't it's not good for business it's not good for consumers um, and it's not good for the banking regulator um, but they had to feel it was good for somebody it was so it was the debt collectors okay. that were real interested in getting this because they were having some problems collecting on other types of debts um, they were having problems filing confessions of judgment, I think, for loans that were not consumer finance loans. And rather than having that fight with clerks of court about what was and was not, uh, what could and could not have a confession of judgment filed, they decided to just try and get rid of the ban on confessions of judgment, and then it would make it easy for them at the clerk's office, down at the local courthouse, to get these things filed. 
Um, and while I hear that, I'm like, this was not the way. Um, I think that it's made more of a mess than it's cleaned up, and that's why we think we'll be able to work with them going forward. Very good. <laughs> yeah. Took a while to get there, but I think, I think we're close. Um, okay, so one big piece, right, confessions of judgment. Weird mess in North Carolina right now, but hopefully going to get resolved. And generally speaking, um, across the Southeast, we have some pretty clear rules about when you can and can't take one on a consumer finance loan. So what other protections might be out there or rules, maybe not protections, but rules are there about consumer finance loans in North Carolina? There's a ton. I'm going to hold up the statute that governs these guys. It's here. It's many double-sided pages long. <laughs> I do not expect anyone to come up with all of these. I certainly couldn't. But there are some key ones that we'll, we'll try and kind of draw out as we talk. Um, and if I can't draw them out, then I'll just tell you guys them. <laughs> I'm nice that way. There's no quiz at the end. Um, so other thoughts? What else might be a rule affecting these types of loans? Even if you don't know what the rule is. Yeah. Interest rates. Interest rate, right? How much you can charge to make a consumer this type of loan. Um, so definitely there's an interest rate cap on these small dollar loans that are paid back in installments. What is that rate? Oh, I am so glad you asked. <laughs> For right now, it's, it's um, hard to know precisely, which is why we really like that there's a disclosure form. Um, so for the first, I'm actually going to open this up so that I get it exactly right for you. I believe that on the first $2,500, nope, we changed it. That's right. So on the first $4,000 that you borrow, the lender can charge 30% per year. Yes. Ooh, right? It's a lot. Okay. <laughs> if you borrow more than $4,000, you will pay 24% per year on the amount between $4,001 and $8,000. And if you borrow more than $8,000, you'll pay 18% per year on the part of the remainder, right? Up to $15,000, which is another rule. That's the maximum amount that a consumer finance lender can lend under this law. So it's a blended interest rate. So it'll just be straight up 30% if you borrow $4,000 or less. And again, that's where we see the bulk of lending happening is around two to $3,000 in North Carolina. Um, but if you borrowed more than that, it would be this blended interest rate. So the first bit would be 30, the next bit would be 24, and the final bit if you borrowed up more than $10,000 um, would come in at 18%. Um, if you borrow between ten and fifteen thousand dollars, it's just a flat eighteen percent interest rate. We have a question: Do yes. credit cards ever hit into this category? They don't. Because, like, Care Credit, which mm. I guess you're familiar with, um, is a credit card, yep. but it's it's really like a personal loan because you're going for a vet or a doctor's bill or something mm -hmm. else. Yep. So is that separate rules? It is separate rules. Open-ended credit. Remember, we talked a little bit about open-ended versus closed-ended credit. And so generally with a credit card-like scenario, you're getting a credit limit and you can borrow up to that. And then every time you pay back some of it, that credit becomes available again. So we call that either open-ended or revolving credit. Um, is governed by different rules, which are set by the federal government um, and are so pervasive that the state can't step into that space, right? The, the way that the law works, they occupy the field, the federal government, so that they govern how credit card um, interest works, what the limits are, um, and what the consumer protections are. Um, installment lending is closed-ended, so you know when you walk in, kind of like when you take out a mortgage loan or a loan to buy your car, they're lending you this specific amount of money. You will pay it back over this specific amount of time, and we can tell you exactly what each of your monthly payments is going to be forever and ever until the loan is paid off. We're contract-based. Yes. Yeah. They're both contract-based, but this one is like very, very closed-ended. Like you know exactly what you, you should know exactly what you're getting into when you get into it. The terms won't change later. Excellent question. 
Okay, so we know limits on interest, which are absurdly high. I should take back absurdly. They are high. Um, not Try not to pass judgment here. Um, we know that there's a cap on how much you can lend, right? $15,000, I said that. Um, what are some other things that might, other rules that might apply in the context of trying to govern this space? Collateral would be used. Yeah, right, so there are rules about collateral, excellent. You cannot secure a consumer finance loan with real property, right? So your house or land cannot be the collateral for a consumer finance loan, but they can take a security interest in a vehicle, they can take a security interest in personal property, and often they do, not always. Hmm. Would that be like pawn shop type stuff? Pawn shops are actually regulated separately from installment lending. So this would be more like, more akin to like a car loan, gotcha. um, right? Where if you don't pay, they can come and repo the car. Um, or if you don't pay, they can come and take your lawnmower if that's what you used to secure the loan um, and sell it to make some of that money back. They won't like actually physically take the thing in order to give you the credit. They just take a security interest and you keep that property. So some other things that show up in this very long statute, um, there's a limit on the number of months that you can repay. Right, and this helps also to control the cost of credit because if you're charging 30% per year, you probably don't want to drag this loan out for 20 years. Um, and so there's a limit on the time you can spend in repayment. And that limit is it has to be at least 12 months and it has to be 96 months or less. There are also rules about how the monthly payments get broken up. They have to be substantially equal, right? So kind of like with a standard home mortgage where you see, you know, I'm gonna be paying $653 every month and then the last payment is gonna be 647 because I'll have paid off everything else. The same idea kind of applies here that the payments should all be exactly the same unless there's some reason to slightly deviate. And there are also some limits on the costs and fees of taking out the loan, right? So the interest rate is just the interest on the loan, right? So we're not talking about the APR of the loan, right? The total cost of the loan. When we talk about that 30%, that 24%, that 18% interest, that is just the interest on the money you borrowed. The lender will also charge you a variety of types of fees. Um, and those are separate from the interest rate. So you will actually pay more than 30% for a $2,000 loan because you will also pay for a bunch of fees at the time when you take out the loan. Most of them are not excessive, right? They're $25 origination fee, um, a processing fee, some recording fees. If there's a security interest, right, they'll wanna record their security interest at the Register of Deeds office so that they can come and legally take your car or your lawnmower. Um, if it's your car, they'll record it with the DMV, not the Register of Deeds, but they'll record it somewhere so that there is a record so that they can come take your stuff if they need to and they will have to pay to record it and they'll pay that and they will pass that cost on to the borrower. So there are also late fees. If you're late making a payment, and those are governed by the statute. Um, there can also be a fee if they reach an agreement with you to defer your loan payment. So if you're struggling to repay one month, they may agree to defer, but they can charge you for that. Um, and there may also be electronic transaction fees, right? If there's a cost to them for taking your payment electronically, they will pass that fee on to you. Um, this law also says that you cannot charge a prepayment penalty meaning if a person is able to pay off the loan early, they can't charge you a fee for that, which is the thing that lenders often like to do because if you prepay, they're not collecting all that interest for all the months that were still on the loan. Um, and so the law explicitly bars them from collecting a prepayment penalty. Questions or comments or concerns? I'm gonna check and see how much, oh, we're doing all right, but not great. Let's keep moving. <laughs> I'm like, well, we'll learn some of the things. We'll learn some of the things. 
Okay, so here we've got, oh good, all of my rules showed up. So you can see some of the stuff we talked about is in the slides. Um, these are the, the sorts of things that are in here in the statute that govern how these loans can be made and what they can charge and how they can collect it. Okay, which brings us to my favorite section, the future of installment lending. Could there be changes coming to North Carolina law? There could be. Um, so there is a proposal by industry um, in many states, and there will be one here in North Carolina to change the state statute that governs how and when these loans can be made. Um, and some of the things that we've seen in other states, um, including Florida, Michigan, Colorado, um, and recently in some proposed uh, changes in North Carolina, we're seeing a desire to dramatically increase the cost of these loans by increasing the interest rate. Um, so there is a, a, a move afoot to change the interest rate to a flat 36% instead of that blend between 30, 24, and 18%. They'd like to be able to charge 36% uh, on all loans up to, I think, $15,000. Uh, yeah, it's a lot. It's, it's, it's more than taking out a cash advance on your credit card, which is a very expensive way to access credit. This is far more expensive. Um, they would also like to increase the interest rate on loans with a higher principal balance, right? So think now that at, at 10 to $15,000 in North Carolina, there's that flat interest rate of 18%, which is still pretty high. They wanna double it, right? Cause it's gonna be 30, if they are successful, it'll be 36% on loans up to $15,000. Um, then they'd like to add a new bracket from fifteen dollars to $25,000, which is an area they can't lend in right now, right? The maximum amount that consumer finance lenders can currently lend is $15,000. They'd like to extend that up to $25,000 and charge 18% interest on the loans from $15,000 to $25,000 is the proposal that we've seen. Um, they also want to substantially increase the cost we didn't really talk a lot about that, but that processing fee when you take out the loan, the late fee, um, they want to increase the amount that they can charge consumers um, for sort of the, the front end fees that don't get put into that interest rate, right? The interest rate is just, you borrowed $8,000, so you're going to pay 36% on that, but you're also going to pay all these other fees. So we're looking at that um, as coming to North Carolina over the next few months. The legislature is in session um, and there, it sounds like, will be a bill. Um, we will try to negotiate with industry to try and get that to be more reasonable, but as of right now, these are some of the terms that they have put forward as what they would like to see in that bill. Um, so we look at the Center for Responsible Lending. DeMarcus, well, just me, I guess now. I work just in North Carolina and feel um, deeply privileged that I get to focus all of my attention right here in my home state. Um, most of the other staff at the Center for Responsible Lending that I work with on our state team work in a bunch of other states. And one of the things that that makes possible for me is that I get to see the work they're doing elsewhere and understand how it inf can inform the work we're doing here. And so last year, a couple of my colleagues did some research, and I think it's out on the table in front of you. Um, it's the fatter, non-PowerPoint <laughs> stuff in front of you. We did some research in Colorado into two of the big installment lending companies that operate both here and in Colorado, and they're the two names that came up at the beginning, uh, One Main and Lindmark. And so those are multi-state companies. Um, we do have, again, a bunch of resident lenders in North Carolina who operate here and are, and are just licensed here. Um, but taking a look at that Colorado research from last year, um, some of my colleagues pulled 67 loan files. Um, and what they found was that there were these enormous charges to get borrowers to buy insurance. And so we did some digging. This has been a practice for a while and we've raised it as a concern periodically over many years. Um, and here we are, we're gonna raise it again, um, that they're still doing this. Basically the insurance that they sell people is not insurance, it's not like health insurance you paid for along with your consumer finance loan. It's insurance so that if you get sick or if you get laid off or if you die, your loan gets paid off. 
so the lender will get their money back, um, but that may or may not help you, right? It could help you if you're worried that if you failed to make a payment that you have something that they could come and take, whether it was your car or your lawnmower, or if you worried that if you died, your estate maybe wouldn't have enough money to both pay off the loan and make sure that your spouse or your children had something to get out of your estate. And so maybe for some people, it is in fact worth it for them to buy the insurance. Um, the pervasive way in which these companies sell the insurance leads us to believe that they are probably not adequately explaining to people what they, who might need and who might not need the insurance, um, right? So they will make loans to folks who, for instance, are on a fixed income because they're retired and receiving social security retirement or a pension um, or who are disabled and are getting social security disability insurance um, payments every month and they might still yet sell them an unemployment or disability insurance policy, which would not help them. <laughs> um, so we see that insurance being added on in a lot of cases, um, which raises some red flags for us. And we also see them refinancing a lot of loans, which also raises some red flags for us, right? If you are making a closed ended credit transaction with someone where they know that they will have to make, for instance, $250 payments for three years, um, and at some point a year into the loan, they've missed a couple of payments and you're refinancing them and extending that loan term out another three or four years, there's a problem with your underwriting, right? That person was not able to actually afford those payments and you're extending the loan term and refinancing it in order to disguise the fact that they were about to default and that you want to keep them in repayment because if your default rate is too high, it's bad for your investors, they get worried. And also your banking regulator may start having some concerns about the quality of your underwriting and start asking some hard questions at your examination. Um, and so we worry when we see we're pulling loan files and seeing a lot of refinances that something is not right. Um, so th that was two things our Colorado research showed was happening there um, in kind of pervasive ways. Um, and this is similar to patterns we saw when we did a similar review of hundreds of cases in North Carolina uh, a little less than a decade ago. Um, there we saw out of the cases that we pulled that over 70% were refinanced and about 10% of the loan amount could be attributed to these insurance products. Meaning if you, you know, that if you borrowed $5,000 that $500 of that was, was attributable to insurance. So they're kind of inflating the amount that you're borrowing. Um, and we see that a little bit still yet. The banking regulator, the Office of the Commissioner of Banks, releases an annual report about these types of loans every year, right? The, the companies that they regulate, they collect information from them and they publish it and make it available. That's one of the things that's required by the law in North Carolina. Um, so in 2021, the last year that we have data for, uh, just over 400,000 loans were approved. 193,000 of those borrowers were charged a collective $7.25 million for what's called credit life insurance. Again, that would pay their loan for them if they died. Um, that seems pretty high <laughs> to me. Um, and over 97,000 borrowers were charged $12.6 million for credit accident and health insurance. Um, and in total, the industry collected over $36 million in insurance fees from borrowers, and that's 10.6% of the industry's profit in 2021. Um, in the slides that you guys have, I've pulled some of the data charts from that Colorado research paper so that you can see how many insurance policies are being sold, how much people were being charged for those insurance premiums, um, they also, in Colorado, were selling a lot of people auto club memberships, which we don't even know what those are. I'm sort of hoping they're kind of like AAA and at least would pick people up if they got a flat tire, uh, but we don't know. Since we're nearly out of time, I'll breeze through this, but these two um, charts are also from that research report. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about what was happening in Colorado and we have sort of reasonable suspicion is probably also still happening in North Carolina, you can take a look at this particularly egregious example of a loan um, 
where the APR that's reported is 20.98% for these folks because they borrowed some money to refinance a loan. They didn't see a dime of this. If you look, you'll see the cash to the borrower is zero. Um, but that they added on thousands of dollars in insurance premiums. Um, and if those insurance costs had been part of the interest rate that was calculated, um, it would have approximately doubled to over 40% uh, the, the rate of interest that they were paying for the credit. Um, the other thing I wanted to sort of mention in passing is that Mariner, one of these big multi-state companies, is currently involved in multi-state litigation. The attorneys general of a bunch of different states listed up here have sued them. North Carolina is not one of them, um, and I am currently in talks with the AG's office to see if they'll tell me why not. Um, but those states are all making a case that Mariner harmed consumers by selling them these add-on insurance products in ways that were pretty duplicitous. Um, and I just included a list from the complaint um, of the things that the AG's offices allege um, Mariner did to um, warrant this lawsuit. And so there's just a lot of like, my personal favorite, I think, is um, the one where they are, I'll, I can't look at it and talk to you guys at the same time, but one where they basically added on the insurance products, even for borrowers that explicitly declined the insurance. <laughs> yeah. Um, and one of the stories in the complaint is from a borrower who repeatedly borrowed with Mariner and could demonstrate that she had always declined the insurance. And so when she said, I also declined the insurance these two times, they have reason to believe her. Um, but they added it back in anyway. Um, so these are the types of things that we're taking a look at in the consumer finance industry as the possible future. Maybe some regulation of insurance products stemming from that lawsuit. Uh, maybe some response from the Colorado Attorney General's office, which is the banking regulator for, um, or the regulator for consumer finance loans in Colorado about insurance add-ons and refinances. Um, and of course, in North Carolina, we're looking at some changes to the costs of these loans um, and, some of, and some other bits too. But I think the most important part is the massive increase in cost that they're looking for um, to pass on to consumers. And with that, I am done. If folks have questions, I am happy to entertain further, further questions or comments. I don't know if anybody on the internet is asking stuff. Is there a way for them to do that? Maybe. Ooh, cool. I have a question. Bring it. Um, it seems like, at least this presentation, you're more after the insurance companies. Does your nonprofit also educate the, uh, the public on how we can not get taken advantage of? Um, we do do some consumer education work largely through our outreach team, which DeMarcus heads up. Um, but by and large, we've actually found that consumer education does not work nearly as well as um, regulation of industry when it comes to um, unfair practices um, or predatory practices. And so I think that there's, again, that sort of like, how do we actually make this work? Um, the way that, that we try to make it work on the Center for Responsible Lending side is by making sure that there's adequate policy in place to protect people from predatory or unfair practices. Um, I will say, and I'm not sure we covered this in the intro, but um, the Center for Responsible Lending is affiliated with a credit union called Self-Help Credit Union. Um, and for their members, they do a great deal of financial education work, um, making sure that they understand both products that they might get from the credit union, but we also have what we call FinCap, financial capability advisors, who work with folks to understand their finances more broadly and what their options are. And so. just to make a direct connection yeah. with self-help, so the uh, Burlington Industries mm -hmm. had a credit union for their members uh, that was Short Course Community Credit Union, which is part of self-help okay. on Battleground. So the, the origins for that branch were here in Reedsville Okay. For Burlington Industries. Good. So. Nice. Thanks, Meryl. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you all um, for being here. This is our first like part of our three-part series. Um, please join us for the next one. It happens on February 14th um, at 12, so same time, same place. Um, thank you to our presenter, Rochelle, um, my colleague. I work closely with her, so, you know. 
I get a little ends on um, this information beforehand. But no, I appreciate the, the content. I think it's super helpful um, to know what installment loans are um, and the potential harms of them, um, especially finding out about the, the business loans and that they can seize uh, an account with, you know, with folks actually paying back their money, which seems counterproductive. But um, appreciate at least flagging it for us. Um, and thank you to the attendees for your engagement online and in person. Um, really appreciate your engagement on this, um, on this issue. Um, but that's it from me. Um, but yeah, I hope you all join us next time. Thank you so much.